you today. So Allison's already told you that I'm a breast radiologist. Here are um, all the ways that you can access the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. And here are my disclosures. I'm here on a volunteer basis. I have no support from industry. So my objectives today are to discuss the basics of breast cancer. We're gonna start really with the basics and the risk factors. Explain how you can reduce your risk of getting breast cancer. Describe methods of screening for breast cancer so if you do get it, it can be found as early as possible so that you're eligible for the least aggressive options for treatment. I'll explain why there are still varying recommendations as to what age to start and how often to screen. And I'll explain the risks associated with dense breasts and what women can do if they have dense breasts. I will be covering some of the slides really quickly, but as you heard from Allison, they will be on the YouTube uh, as of tomorrow, so you can revisit them and read them more slowly at your own pace. So let's start at the beginning. What is breast cancer? It's a disease where a group of cells loses its normal control. And these abnormal cells grow, usually into a lump, but not always and they can invade and damage the adjacent normal tissue. They can also spread to other parts of the body, like lymph nodes, lung, brain, bone, et cetera, liver. Breast cancer isn't always noticed by the presence of a lump. Sometimes it can attach to the overlying skin and pull it in, so it looks like pu puckered, like in this picture. Breast cancer is not life-threatening when it's just in the breast. It's when it spreads to other parts of the body, like you see here, in the lungs or here when it's spread to the brain and that's when it can become live, uh, lethal. It can also spread as I mentioned to the liver. I don't have a picture of that to show you. When breast cancer spreads to the bone it can cause areas of weakness that can fracture easily even without a fall or an injury. So here's a picture of a bone scan. You can see where the injection was made that what we call a hot spot and there is a, an abnormality in the upper thigh on the patient's left. Here you can see the bone has actually fractured. This is the thigh bone. This is a bone scan. This is an x-ray. And it fractures very easily. For example, if somebody has spread of cancer to their ribs or their spine, sometimes those bones can fracture even just from coughing hard without falling. Now, you've heard that one in eight statistic, but that's not across all ages. Breast cancer is very uncommon, but still occurs in the 20s and 30s. But look at the probability. It jumps a little bit dramatically in the 40s to 1 in 69, and it keeps rising. It never drops. Women sometimes tell me, well, my doctor said I don't need to have a mammogram now that I'm 70. But unless a woman dies of another disease, her risk of getting breast cancer keeps getting higher the older she gets. Now, there are factors that can increase a woman's risk of getting breast cancer, many of which are beyond our control, like having a breast cancer genetic mutation, or having had chest wall radiation, say for uh, Hodgkin's disease, having dense breast tissue, which I'll talk a lot about later, a family history, especially when it's in a relative, like a mother or sister or daughter. If you've had a previous biopsy that showed atypical cells, that puts you at an increased risk of getting breast cancer at any time in your life. Women who start having periods early or have menopause later are at a higher risk, and women who've never had children are at a higher risk than women who had. You can't control most of those, but here are some factors you can control. Minimal or no estrogen after menopause, minimal or no alcohol, a low fat diet, moderate exercise reduces the risk of getting breast cancer, and maintaining a healthy body weight, especially after menopause, reduces the risk of cancer, smoking to a lesser effect. But we now that know that having dense breast tissue is a more important risk factor than having a family history. That was in a study published last year. So most of what I'll be talking today is about early detection, finding breast cancer as early as possible, but it would be even better if we could prevent it from happening. And if people modified their lifestyle habits around the controllable risk factors on the previous slide, especially if we started in childhood, we could probably present prevent the vast majority of cancers. And even if you waited until middle age to clean up your lifestyle, we could probably prevent half of the cancers that are occurring now. Even walking 30 minutes per day can lower breast cancer risk by 20%. Each drink of alcohol per day, and that's beer, wine, or spirits, raises breast cancer risk by 10%. 
So please come back later to this slide for more details. And here's a list, again, showing some of the things you can do to re reduce your risk of getting breast cancer. But please remember, we are all at risk. The most important risk factor is being female, and the second is getting older. I sometimes women, hear women say, I don't need mammograms because no one in my family's had breast cancer. The fact is that 75% of breast cancers occur in women with no family history. So how do we screen for cancer? We want to find it before it's feelable, when it's as early as possible. And why do we do that? Because we want to save lives. We want to reduce mortality by finding and treating the disease earlier. But we also want to allow less aggressive treatment which would be required for a more advanced disease. When we find cancer earlier, women are more likely to be good candidates for lumpectomy and avoid a mastectomy. They can have a sentinel node biopsy instead of an axillary dissection, and they can have less aggressive or even avoid chemotherapy. I'll come back to this later too. There are lots of ways of screening for breast cancer. Breast self-exam, clinical breast exam, that's the breast exam done by your doctor, Mammography, 2D or 3D mammography, ultrasound, which can be handheld or automated, breast MRI, breast specific gamma imaging or molecular breast imaging, and now we have dual energy contrast enhanced mammography. But I want to be very clear, thermography is not a valid test for screening for breast cancer. It's been completely discredited. It's very good at finding big cancers close to the skin, but those aren't the ones that we have trouble finding. It misses smaller cancers deeper in the breast, and it has loads of false positives. So here are some facts that everyone agrees on. Everyone. Women are 20 to 49% less likely to die of breast cancer if they are invited to have or actually have screening mammography than women who don't. And we know that annual screening saves the most lives if you start at 40 and you screen annually. And in fact, these are recognized by even organizations that recommend starting screening later or screening less often. The current guidelines of what age to start screening and how often to screen vary widely. And these conflicting guidelines, as you can see, some start at 40, some start 40 to 50, some start 50. These conflicting guidelines did not arise because of alternative facts. They're because of different value judgments applied by these various organizations to the same facts. And you need to know what their priorities are to see if they align with your values and your priorities. They may not. Now, the media like to stir up passions. And this article was about the 2014 release of the 25-year follow-up of a screening study done in Canada in the 1980s. It was poorly designed, it was poorly executed, and so it came to the wrong conclusion. In fact, it was the only one of many randomized trials done for screening mammography that did not show reduced mortality in women having mammograms. I and many others internationally are painfully familiar with the details of that trial, and we have to stand on guard to respond when the media give it any attention. In fact, in 2002, the World Health Organization recommended that this Canadian trial not be used in making guidelines. And yet both the American and Canadian task forces that issue screening guidelines still include it. We know from decades of research that mammograms save lives. You often hear though that mammography is the only method that has been proven to reduce mortality. And strictly speaking, that's true, but why is that? That's because the only way you can make that claim that it reduces mortality is by doing a special experiment called a randomized controlled trial. And there have been very many trials of mammography. Right now, there is a randomized trial of screening ultrasound being done in Japan. And the early results suggest that it too will show reduced mortality. But there are other methods of screening like MRI, for example, um, and molecular breast imaging that have not been studied uh, for mortality reduction. And yet, MRI is used for screening high-risk women, which raises the question, why do some tests get approval without a randomized trial, but not others? Randomized controlled trials of mammography have shown a 15 to 20% mortality reduction in women invited to be screened. I pay attention to that word, they've been invited to be screened. But in observational studies, we've seen a 40 to 49% mortality reduction in women who attend screening. That's because women in randomized trials don't always have the test that they were invited to have. 
So if a woman is in a trial and is invited to have a mammogram, but she doesn't, and later she dies of breast cancer, her death will still be counted in the mammogram group, even though she never had the mammogram. Observational studies track the results by actually who had the test, not whether they were invited. And that explains why they show much better results. This observational study compared women who had mammography to those that didn't. It was a pan-Canadian study. They obtained data on almost 3 million women attending screening programs in Canada. And they showed that women who attend screening are overall 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than women who don't. And for women in their 40s, it was even better. They're 44% less likely to die. Here's another study that used different methodology. This was, uh, they looked at over 7,000 women diagnosed with breast cancer over a 10 year period at two of the hospitals in the Harvard system in Boston. They looked at the women who died. 609 of them died of breast cancer and 905 died of other causes. Most of the deaths, 71%, occurred in the 20% of women who did not have regular mammograms, and 29% occurred in the women who were regularly screened. Of all the breast cancer deaths, only 13% occurred in women older than 70, but 50% of the breast cancer deaths occurred in women under the age of 50. 31% occurred in women who were initially diagnosed between 40 and 49. This also drives home that women should start screening at age 40. Breast cancer is less common in the 40s, but it often grows faster, and we want to detect it as soon as possible. So this is how a mammogram is done. I suspect many of you know this very well. Each breast is compressed twice, once from side to side, and the other from top to bottom. And a low-dose x-ray is taken in each position. And here are what the pictures look like. This is the top to bottom squeeze pictures, and these are the side to side. And in this lady, you can see she has a cancer in her right breast in both views. It's easy to see because cancer is white. And this lady, her, her breasts are mostly dark gray. She has fatty breasts and lots more on this later. So we know that mammograms can find cancers early and save lives and that annual screening saves the most lives. So why don't all provinces start screening at 40 and screen annually? Well, according to the Canadian and US task forces, there are harms of mammography. And these task forces and the way they looked at the statistics believed that the harms outweigh the benefits. They must be pretty significant harms to outweigh saving lives, don't you think? So let's look at them and see if you agree. Pain from the compression, well, it's not a big harm, but of course mammograms are uncomfortable and they should be, but not excruciating. The reason we compress is to spread out the tissue so we can see better, and that includes seeing cancers easily. The discomfort is few, for a few seconds. All modern mammography machines have a release switch so that the compression releases as soon as the exposure is made. The tech doesn't have to walk back around to you to release the compression. Now, occasionally I'll have a patient tell me that her last mammogram was awful and she's reluctant to have another one. I tell her and the technologist, that I want her to stop compression when the woman tells her to, that it's better to have a less than perfect mammogram than no mammogram. And these actually always turn out fine. I've never had a patient say to stop so soon that the mammogram was poor quality. So the other, um, we'll, we'll address each of these harms. Let's talk about the next one, radiation. You can see that's almost not even a concern, but I know that it's a concern for some of you. Um, and so let's talk about that next. So there's natural radiation all around us all the time. It comes from the cosmos. The sun and stars send cosmic radiation to Earth, and the amount varies with elevation. So you get more radiation if you're at a higher elevation, say, you'll see later, living in Colorado. Radiation comes from the ground. Radioactive materials exist naturally in soil and rock. It comes from the air. All air contains radon, which is actually the greatest background source of radiation. And even water contains small amounts of dissolved radioactivity. And all organic matter, both plant and animal, contains radioactive carbon and potassium. But the radiation risk from mammography is minimal. 
it's primarily for really young women, less than 20 years old. And here's the dose of a mammogram, 0.4 millisieverts. Here's the, here's the dose of radiation you would get from a transcontinental, say flying from Los Angeles to New York or from Vancouver to Halifax, um, 0.08 millisieverts. I said before that the higher you, all in, you are in altitude, the higher the dose you get of natural radiation. So the dose of a mammogram turns out to be similar to just seven weeks of living on Earth. Every seven weeks, you get the same dose from the natural sources as you would for a mammogram. And if you live in Colorado, the mammogram is the equivalent of three to four weeks of living on Earth. Now, the risk versus benefit of radiation, and this is this is a good study done by my colleagues at Sunnybrook in Toronto. And what they calculated is that for every thousand women having um, a mammogram every two years from age 50 to 69, the radiation would hypothetically, it's not for sure, cause 0.27 cancers and cause 0.04 deaths. But those mammograms would prevent five deaths, which is 125 times more than the lives lost, and save 105 years of life. So avoiding mammograms for fear of radiation, they say, is not a winning bet. And we know that annual mammograms save even more lives. So even though there's more radiation with annual mammography, the map is still in favor of having mammograms. This graph is from an excellent website, densebreast-info.org, and it shows the radiation from various tests. The lowest radiation is from bone densitometry or chest x-rays. Mammography is the third lowest. The blue vertical line here on the right is the amount of radiation that as somebody who works uh, in, a, in the field is allowed to get every year that is felt to be safe. And you'll notice that it's over 12 times the dose of the mammogram, not that I'm suggesting that you need 12 mammograms a year. But look at these other tests and how high their radiation doses are. VSGI is one of the screening tests for cancer, which I'm not going to recommend. But you can see if you've ever had a PET scan or a CT scan, you're getting a WAP of radiation. False alarms, though, are the biggest harm in the eyes of the task forces, and here are the numbers. For every 1,000 women who have a screening mammogram, 93% or 930 will get a normal result. Now, some of them will be false negative, but they get a normal result. 7% or 70 of the women will be told that they need additional tests, and the majority of them will only need one or more additional mammographic pictures or maybe an ultrasound. 16%, so of the 70 who are recalled, 11 of them will be told that they need a needle biopsy. Now, needle biopsies should not be significantly more painful than a blood test. We use local anesthetic, and it's we're pretty generous with that local. But of those 11 women who had the needle biopsy, four will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So if you're told you need a needle biopsy, you really should have it because it, you know we want to rule out cancer, but there is a reasonable possibility that you might have it. So do women care about their recall rate? Would they rather skip the mammogram just so they don't have to go through that anxiety of waiting for the extra tests? The task forces think that we should spare women the anxiety of false alarms, and that's why they recommend starting screening later and screening less often, even if they know that more women will die. What do women think about these false alarms? Well, the researchers in Pittsburgh studied this. They surveyed all the women attending for routine screening over a five-month period. And 97% of them said that having a recall, so-called false alarm, would not deter them from continuing with regular screening. 86% said they would have been willing to be recalled more often for a non-invasive test, or 82% said I'll even have an invasive procedure if it might increase the chances of detecting cancer earlier if it's present. So that's what you have to consider when you decide whether to have a mammogram. My colleague, Dr. Jian Lee in New York, studied the effect of education for the public on anxiety and found that women felt empowered and more confident in their decision process and more willing to attend screening. And I'm hoping that after this lecture, you'll feel the same. Overdiagnosis is the possibility that some cancers we find at screening would never surface on their own, so there's no need to know about them. And it's probable that there are some cancers that grow so slowly they may never become life-threatening. The problem is we don't know how to separate these out at this point. My job is to find cancer. 
It's somebody else's job to decide how to treat it. For example, a woman might die of something else before her cancer were to become life-threatening. She could die of heart disease, a different cancer, or be in a car accident. The challenge is that most of us don't have a crystal ball. And if you knew that you were going to be killed in a car accident tomorrow or die of a stroke six months from now, then of course you don't need a mammogram. The next couple of slides are a really good analogy, uh, the risk of a false alarm. Uh, and it's uh, Dr. Martin Yaffe again talking about smoke alarms, but I'm gonna skip these for the sake of time and you can come back and read those on YouTube. So the panel that carries a lot of weight in Canada for screening guidelines is called the Canadian Task Force for Preventive Health Care. There are no breast experts on the task force, but they are the ones that issue guidelines about breast cancer screening. They think the harm of transient anxiety from re being recalled from a screening exam outweighs the benefits of early detection. And for this reason, they recommend against any routine screening in women in the 40s. They say that women over 50 should be screened every two to three years. There's actually no science on what to, on what to base that recommendation. They say that women should be told not to do breast self-exam. And they say that even family doctors should stop doing breast exams. But they weren't ready or worried about radiation. And here, this uh, uh, comic came from a newspaper in Vernon. And it says, uh, here's how they feel about it. Don't worry, don't worry your pretty little heads about it. So how did they come to these conclusions? Uh, they underestimated the benefits of mammography by referring only to the randomized trials instead of looking at observational studies. And they exaggerated the harms of mammographic screening, uh, making a big deal about the recalls, even when women say they would rather be recalled and be checked out better. Now, the US Preventative Service Task Force came out with similar recommendations um, and uh, doctors Hendrick and Helvey did this study. They calculated the consequences for women who were going to be turning 40 in the next 10 years, and that they calculated that 100,000 more women would die of breast cancer by starting at 50 and screening every two years compared to having annual mammograms starting at 40. So I believe it makes sense to screen women in their 40s, but they're not offered screening um, in all provinces in Canada. Women in their 40s are often caring for young children and aging parents. They are working and contributing to the economy. They are not expendable. And we know from the Pan-Canadian study that for women in the 40s who have mammograms, they're 44% less likely to die of breast cancer. Uh, even the Canadian U.S. task forces agree that screening annually starting at 40 would save the most lives, but they think it's more important to spare women the anxiety of a recall. In most provinces, women can self-refer every two years, beginning at 40 or 50, depending on the province. In British Columbia, where I live and work, women with a mother or sister who has had breast cancer are allowed to come every year. And in some provinces, women are recalled annually if they have dense breast tissue. Now, the flaw in only letting women go annually if they have a mother or sister with breast cancer, remember what I told you, 75% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. So you're only gonna let some of the women who are destined to get breast cancer have the opportunity for early detection. So the task forces only use the data from the randomized controlled trials to determine the benefits of screening. But randomized trials can only show mortality reduction. And there are other significant benefits of early detection that the task forces did not consider. The option for having breast conservation surgery, in other words, a, lump a lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy, the option to avoid an axillary dissection and to avoid or have less aggressive chemotherapy. This is what a mastectomy looks like. This is what a woman can look like after a lumpectomy. Dr. Perry from the London Breast Institute looked at his data on 184 women diagnosed with breast cancer in their 40s and the likelihood of having a mastectomy related to how recently her last mammogram was done. For women whose last mammogram was in the last year, only 22% needed a mastectomy. For women whose mammogram was done more than a year before or who hadn't had a mammogram, more than half of them need a mastectomy. And you can see that the tumors were bigger the further away the woman was from her last mammogram. She was more likely to have multiple tumors and higher grade disease the further away she was from her most recent mammogram. And just a, a very recent publication from New York, 
these research sh showed the other benefits of early detection. Women who've had screening mammograms less often are more likely to need chemotherapy, have mastectomy, and require an axillary dissection. Now this is what lymphedema looks like. It's swelling in the arm and hand from blockage of the lymphatic vessels in the armpit. It's a side effect of the traditional armpit surgery done as part of breast cancer lymph node staging. It's permanent, and as you can imagine, it is life-changing. It's arguably the worst part of breast cancer for many women. When women have cancer detected early, they can have a sentinel node biopsy instead of axillary dissection with a much lower risk of lymphedema. Chemotherapy is awful, but unlike lymphedema, it's not forever. But now with genomic testing of the actual tumor, many women can avoid chemo if their cancer is small and if there are no positive nodes. That's another reason to find cancers early. And the task forces didn't even consider this as being a benefit. So when they said the harms outweighed the benefits, they were ignoring some pretty important benefits. So let's talk about breast density. What's the big deal with breast density? Well, we are pretty good at recognizing cancer on a mammogram when it's visible. And here's an obvious cancer in a 55-year-old woman. The reason I say it's obvious is you can see it has very jaggedy edges, and these little white dots are associated suspicious calcifications. It's relatively easy to see cancer when the breast is mainly fatty on the mammogram, like in this woman. Fat is dark gray, cancers are white, normal tissue is white. Here's what normal tissue looks like, this white stuff. As the amount of normal breast tissue increases relative to the amount of fat, it becomes harder to see mammograms. This would be called a heterogeneously dense breast. That's why you often hear us saying that when women have dense breasts, it's like trying to find a snowball in a snowstorm. And some women have virtually no fat and they're completely dense. And even a large cancer could be missed in this kind of breast, uh, dense breast. We've known since the 1970s that breast density is related to cancer risk. Dr. Wolf described, described four density patterns, and he found that women with dense breasts were at much higher risk of developing cancer than women with fatty breasts. Radiologists still grade density into four categories. Some provinces use the old quartile system where the radiologist sub subjectively decides what percentage of the tissue is dense, so you can have less than 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and greater than 75%. A new system introduced in uh, sorry, 2014, not yet used by all the provinces, uses A, B, C, D, and is based on the possibility of the dense breast tissue masking a cancer. So even a woman like this who has much less dense tissue, if it's really, really dense, you know a cancer could hide in there. So she could still be a D with the new system. Here's an example of dense breast tissue hiding a cancer. This is actually an acquaintance of mine. And at age 50, she had a screening mammogram which was read as negative. Remember, negative doesn't always mean no cancer. And eight months later, she came back because she noticed a lump in her left breast. These are the pictures of the left breast and this little triangle you see, that's a sticker that the mammography technologist tapes onto her skin over the lump. And we repeated her mammogram and it's still negative. We even did a 3D mammogram on, on her, which I won't show you, and it was completely negative. But when I put the ultrasound probe down on her lump, there it was, 3.2 centimeter cancer, easily seen on ultrasound. It had already spread to her lymph nodes. When a cancer is diagnosed after the most recent screening mammogram was negative, it's called an interval cancer. And interval cancers are 18 times more common in women with dense breasts. And we see cases like this every single week. But here's the thing, dense breasts are common and they're normal. Every woman has fat, glands, and fibrous tissue in her breasts. But as I've just shown you, the proportions vary from one woman to another. Breasts that are more than 50% dense are called dense breasts. And more than 40% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. Sometimes, but not always, uh, breast density can decrease as women get older. And while it's normal to have dense breasts, women need to know if they have dense breasts so they can understand the risks. In Canada, there are 3.4 million women over the age of 40 with dense breasts. Over 800,000 women in Canada are in the highest category the greater than 75% or the D category. And the only way to know if you have dense breasts is on a mammogram. You can't tell by feel or look. 
So here's why it's important to know if you have dense breasts. Well, women who have denser breasts are at a higher risk of ever getting breast cancer. Plus, we know that a mammogram will be less sensitive at finding her cancer if she has dense breasts. And if she does get cancer, it's more likely to be larger and more often lymph node positive. And as I've already told you, there's 18 times the risk of having an interval cancer. And these cancers tend to have a worse prognosis than a screen detected cancer. So as I told you, the only one who can tell you if you have dense breasts is the radiologist when viewing a mammogram. You can't tell by touch. You can't tell by looking. Lumpy breasts are not the same as dense breasts. You can have dense breasts either large or small. Both fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, firm, or lumpy. And some provinces like Nova Scotia and Alberta are beginning to use software to measure the level of density rather than the radiologist uh, subjectively uh, determining the breast density. So what? how does ultrasound fit in? Well, I've already shown you one case where ultrasound had no problem seeing the cancer even when it was missed on her state-of-the-art 3D mammogram. For many years, it was believed that ultrasound could not find cancers that were not visible on mammography and were too small to feel. But we published this paper over 20 years ago, and it was followed by work from multiple other institutions and then multi-center trials that showed time and again that high-resolution ultrasound could indeed find cancers that were too small to be feelable, but they'd been missed on the mammogram, largely because of dense breast tissue. This was a multi-center trial performed uh, in both Canada and the, US, and the United States. They found 5.3 cancers for every thousand women that they screened in the first year, and then averaging out over all three years, 4.3 cancers per thousand women screened. And here's the good news. These were real significant cancers. They weren't the precancers. 94% of them were invasive, but they were small. The median size was a centimeter, and 96% of those that were staged were node negative. Now, MRI is a much more sensitive test at finding cancer. Even after they did ultrasound on all these women, um, they found an additional 14.7 cancers per thousand women after the negative mammogram and ultrasound. But 42% of the women who were offered MRI had declined. So ultrasound can be done either with a handheld probe or with auto an automated probe. Um, this probe automatically scans about a third of the breast at a time. And I understand that ABUS is available. This, we call this uh, automated breast ultrasound. ABUS is available at some clinics in Ontario and Alberta. Any ordinary ultrasound machine uh, can do breast ultrasound, but not all clinics offer it. And you might have trouble getting your family doctor to refer you. If you have ABUS done, by the way, it's best done in a clinic that offers mammography and needle biopsies as well. Now, in spite of all the emerging evidence on breast density, it was still not being shared with women, and in many cases, not with their doctors. Dr. Nancy Capello is a PhD in educational leadership, and she lives in Connecticut. In 2004, only weeks after her routine annual screening mammogram was reported as negative, she found a lump in her breast, and after ultrasound showed a cancer, she was diagnosed as a stage 3C with 13 positive lymph nodes. She started the grassroots movement to get women notified when they have dense breasts. And since the medical establishment pushed her away, she went to legislators. And, and the, uh, there are now 35 states with some degree of breast density notification. And here they are in pink. Uh, in the past few weeks, let me just go back. Um, after I had to submit, submit my slides for this presentation, we've had some wonderful news in Canada. Thanks to the efforts of the group called Dense Breast Canada, BC is the first province to announce that starting this week, starting yesterday, women will be informed of their breast density when they have a screening mammogram. And several other provinces are also considering it, but they need to hear your voices. So speak up. Connecticut because that's where Dr. Capello lives, was the first state to legislate, and they now have several years of data, and they're finding additional three to four cancers per thousand women year after year after year, cancers that were missed on mammograms. Again, they're very small, and although they had a very low uh, positive predictive value, that means they were recommending lots of biopsies in year one, as they get more experience, their PPV has increased significantly. And even though uh, screening ultrasound is covered by insurance in Connecticut, only 30% of eligible women um, are attending. 
Here's some pictures given to me, one of my colleagues at Yale, where they're, Yale is in Connecticut, uh, where they found these small cancers, all in women with actually not that dense breast. This would probably be a, a C. This is definitely a B or a C, and here's a C. So even the cancers, even the women with not screamingly dense breasts. Now your doctor might be unaware of all this. Your doctor might be unaware of the greater risk of getting breast cancer when breasts are dense, and, uh, and might not even know that having dense breasts is a stronger risk factor than having a family history. Women with dense breasts are five times higher risk of getting breast cancer than those with fatty breasts. And of the greater likelihood of a cancer being missed on a mammogram, your family doctor might not know that either. 50% of cancers are missed in women with the highest density. And they might not even know that ultrasound can find those cancers missed on a mammogram. So you're, you, may, you already might know more than your family doctor about all this stuff. You might have heard about a new kind of mammogram called a 3D mammogram or tomosynthesis, and it is a better mammogram. It finds 30% more cancers than uh, regular 2D mammograms. It has fewer false alarms, which is also great, but it only sees about half the cancers that are visible on ultrasound, the ones that were missed on mammography. Uh, and uh, here are some examples of cancers found on ultrasound that were missed even in women who had 3D mammograms. Again, these are from my colleague um, at Yale. So I have just a few slides on other technologies because most of these aren't done in Canada. So MRI, of course, is, is widely used, but it's very expensive. Um, not everybody's uh, comfortable going into the magnet. It's uh, claustrophobia is a big deal. Women who have metal implants or allergic to the contrast can't have it. Um, and it so as I said, it requires an injection of uh, an intravenous injection, which makes it a whole lot more complicated than a mammogram or an ultrasound. We also don't know what the long-term uh, effects are of these gadolinium deposits. That's the stuff they inject intravenously. We now know it gets deposited in the brain and we don't know what the long-term effects are. There is a new way of doing breast MR though that's called abbreviated MRI or fast MRI. Um, and it's faster for the woman in the machine and faster for the radiologist to read. So this test is being studied now and if they can bring down the cost, it might be used more often for women at average and higher than average risk, but we're not there yet. Contrast enhanced dual energy mammography is another test that shows province promise. It finds almost as many cancers as MRI, but has fewer false alarms, but it also requires an intravenous injection and it's not available anywhere in Canada to my knowledge. And there are two different nuclear medicine tests that can find cancer. Both of them require intravenous injection of a radioactive material. And that radioactive material, because it's intravenous, it goes to the whole body. And so it's, it's a significant dose uh, of radiation, uh, especially to the pelvis. So you wouldn't want to do it in young women because uh, when, it, when it's getting excreted and, and stored in the bladder, it's the, radiated, ra the ovaries that are getting radiated. So how can you find out your breast density? Well, it completely depends on where you live. If you live in British Columbia and you have a screening mammogram, you're going to be told. But what I would do, every province is a little, I would direct you to the densebreastcanada.ca website and there are easy to follow instructions on how to find your breast density. And then if you find out you have dense breasts, what should you do? Well, first of all, keep having mammograms because they detect cancer that's not visible even on ultrasound. I would recommend, ignore the Canadian task force, do regular breast self-examination, ideally every month. If you're still premenopausal, do it when you're just finishing your period. If you're menopausal, it doesn't really matter what time of the month, but you have to start sometime. And when you first start, you might be really surprised at how much texture you're feeling in your breasts. All women have texture and lumpiness in their breasts, but no two women are the same. And the benefit of doing breast self-exam is that you will very quickly become the expert in what your normal texture is. And if you ever notice a change in that texture, please go see your doctor, even if you just had a negative mammogram. I would also recommend that you consider modifying your lifestyle factors that we talked about earlier to decrease your cancer risk, like getting to and staying at a healthy body weight, doing moderate exercise, and decreasing hormone use if you can. Speak with your doctor about your level of breast density and the associated risks, any additional risk factors you have like family history and so on, and then the best screening options for you. If you have dense breasts, 
and you want to find cancer early, consider adding additional screening like ultrasound or MRI. And if you are diagnosed with breast cancer, considering um, requesting an MRI before you decide on what kind of surgery you need, just in case uh, there are additional cancers they don't know about, which might convert you from a lumpectomy to a mastectomy. That's a pine, I will admit that's a controversial point right there. So if you've had cancer and you've been treated for cancer and you have dense breast tissue, you're at a higher risk of getting breast cancer in the other breast. So do all of the above if you have dense tissue. The risk of getting cancer in the other breast is higher in women with dense breasts. This study showed that breast density can decrease in women on tamoxifen or on chemotherapy, but not on radiation. If a woman is given tamoxifen or chemo and her breast density decreases more than 10%, it's a sign that maybe she's at a lower risk of getting cancer in her other breast. Women who've had breast cancer are at a higher risk of it coming back in the same breast if they have dense tissue, and the risk is higher in women who did not have radiation. After lumpectomy and radiation, the overall risk of recurrence is 10 to 15% in over 10 years. But patients with high mammographic density have a much greater risk of local recurrence compared to women with the least dense breasts. And the risk of local recurrence at 10 years is higher for women who didn't get radiotherapy than for women who did. So you sometimes see administrators propose that we should do mammograms only on women at higher than average risk, but I'll tell you that doesn't work. Dr. Lisa Price at UCSF showed that risk-based screening misses more than 75% of the breast cancers. She looked at 136 cancers detected in women in their 40s at UCSF. Almost 90% of them had no strong family history, 90% didn't have extremely dense breasts, and of the 136 cancers, 50% were invasive, 91% were hormone receptor positive, and 78% were node negative. So these are mainly good prognosis cancers. Researchers in the UK looked at what would happen if they screened less often in women who they thought were at lower risk. They were thrilled to say that the level of overdiagnosis decreased and they saved money, but if you read the fine print, 10% more women would die, and that's not okay. So the takeaway points today is everybody should have mammograms, ideally annually starting at 40 but certainly go as soon as your screening program will allow and as often as they will allow. Uh, some cancers are not detectable on a mammogram. Most abnormalities on mammograms are not cancer, so if you get recalled, please don't panic. <clears throat> Women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer, and 3D mammogra mammograms find more cancer than 2D and have fewer false alarms, and I certainly believe that the benefits outweigh the harms. Ultrasound can find cancer missed on a mammogram in dense breasts, even if we use 3D mammography. And remember that having dense breasts poses two risks. Number one, you're at a higher risk of getting breast cancer. And number two, the mammogram is less accurate. So it's important to know your breast density and understand these risks and to speak to your doctor about your risk factors. Please tell your friends, family, and colleagues what you learned just now about screening and density. And for more information on breast density, please visit the website www.densebreastcanada.ca. They're also on Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. That was a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot. I hope uh, our attendees did as well. We do have a few questions coming in now, and so just to remind everybody that uh, we do have some time for questions here. If you have any questions for Dr. Gordon, now is the time. You can uh, ask your questions by typing them into the panel on your right in the questions panel. Uh, so the first question here says, uh, each time I was diagnosed, it was via ultrasound, not the memo, due to high breast density. I was never told it was likely due to high density in 2002 and 2008. Delighted it's finally coming to light. Uh, have been told density can change, so I would like to know, does it really change that much, and if so, does it make a uh, mammogram more easily available to able to diagnose if uh, your density gets lower, for example? Yes, it can decrease, not in all women, and it's really wait and see. Uh, typically, when it changes is when women go through menopause. If women take hormones after menopause, they'll retain their original breast density, but some women stay dense forever. You can have an 80-year-old who's really, really dense, and I've seen very, very young women with fatty breasts, so it's not really predictable 
whose breast density is going to diminish as they age. And yes, if it does diminish, the less breast tissue, the easier it is to see cancers. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the second question here says, hello, Dr. Gordon, would you recommend a biopsy for a BRCA1 mutation carrier after a mass with a rim enhancement is detected by breast MRI? Okay, full disclosure, I do not do breast MRI. So I'm going to have to I'm going to have to decline the question. That's fair enough. Uh, third question here says, how does tamoxifen make your breast less dense? Tamoxifen is speaking simply is an anti-estrogen. So just as when a woman goes through menopause and her ovaries stop making uh, estrogen, some women's breast density will diminish. Uh, when some women take tamoxifen, their breast density will diminish. But it doesn't happen in all women. It's kind of a wait and see. Okay, perfect. Um, there's another question here. Let me just get through this here. My mom and I both have dense breasts. She had cancer at age 80. I had an ultrasound and a mammogram. What else can I do? Can I have a yearly mammogram? I'm in Ontario and was told my next one's in two years. Really? Even with the mother with breast cancer, they're not letting you come every year? what it says. So um, I would absolutely recommend you have a mammogram every year. I mean, you've heard me say, I think everybody should have a mammogram every year. <laughs> um, and when you have yep. a mother with breast cancer, even though her being 80 is not the same increased risk to you as if she'd had a, uh, uh, her um, cancer at age, uh, age 50, let's say. So uh, the older the relative is when she gets her cancer, the less of a risk it is for you. But I would absolutely encourage you to try to have a mammogram every year. And what I tell women who have dense breasts and a family history is try to have an ultrasound every year as well. Um, you should definitely do breast self-examination. You should definitely clean up your lifestyle if, you, if there's anything to clean up. But um, what I recommend is if you are going to have any supplementary screening, like with ultrasound, you don't have it at the same time of year as you have your mammogram. You have your mammogram, then six months later you have your ultrasound, then six months later you have your mammogram, and so you're alternating. That way you're having each test once a year, but you're getting screened every six months. So touch wood, if something ever does start to brew, you will find it soon, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, got lots of questions piling in here, so we'll get through as many as we can. Um, this one says, uh, I've had cancer in my left breast with lymph nodes involved. I've done chemo, surgery, and radiation. Uh, what are the chances of getting cancer in my right breast? Um, your risk of getting cancer in the other breast is higher than the average woman. Once you've had cancer in one side, you're at a higher risk to get it in the other side. And your risk is even higher if, the, if your breasts are dense. So if you've, had, if you've had cancer and you've been treated and you have dense breasts, I would recommend the same screening schedule as the previous question. You're going to have your mammogram once a year. Um, if you had access to 3D, I would recommend you have a 3D mammogram. And then in the alternating six-month intervals, you would have supplementary screening, like, for example, with ultrasound. I should tell you that in the United States, the American College of Radiology just came out with new guidelines as to which women should have MR, MRI. And they're recommending that any woman who's had cancer before the age of 50 should have regular breast MRs. And any woman who has had cancer older than 50 who has dense breasts should also have breast MRI. We're using ultrasound kind of like the poor man's MRI. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, okay, so our next question says, uh, thank you for this amazing and informative presentation. Uh, I'd read something about risk-based screening and thought it me meant that all women would be offered mammograms every two years, but those with a higher risk would be offered additional screenings with other tools and more frequent screening based on individual risk. Uh, can you uh, once again explain individual risk-based screening? So it, it, it that's in the eye of the beholder. So um, some people would say, risk-based screening is that everybody gets a mammogram every year and women at higher risk also get other stuff like ultrasound or MRI. But in places where the standard is to screen only every two years, then they're going to call that their, their usual and um, have women at higher risk either come more frequently for mammograms or have supplementary screening, for example, with ultrasound. One could argue, though, what's the point of doing a mammogram more often 
in a woman with dense breasts, if we know that we're going to miss 50% of the cancers, perhaps those women should be having instead of a mammogram every year, like they're doing in Ontario, maybe they should be having a mammogram if they insist every other year and then the ultrasound in the intervening years. But what some people use the term risk-based mean to mean is that some women wouldn't even have mammograms or would have them every three years. And, and then uh, women deemed to be at a average or higher risk would be uh, have mammograms more often. So there's, there's no fixed definition of what risk-based screening actually means. That's really interesting. Thank you. We, we really have no way of knowing, of determining who mm -hmm. is at low risk. As I said, the greatest risk is being female and the second biggest risk is getting older. And 75% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. So who are you gonna, who are you gonna say doesn't need a mammogram? Maybe one day right. we'll be, we'll, maybe one day there'll be a blood test or some way of figuring out who's at such low risk that they need less aggressive screening. Very true, it's new territory still. Now we have the next question here. One second, there we go. It says, um, I have a needle biopsy on Thursday as, as the result of a lump discovered that show up on ultrasound. Uh, it was my request for biopsy rather than a six month follow up. Is a biopsy conclusive? Um, so first of all, I'll tell you that if you were offered six month follow up, the radiologist has to be more than 98% sure it's not cancer. And um, depending on what kind of needle they use, yes, it can be conclusive. If it's, um, if it's just a cyst, but it didn't look completely like a typical simple cyst, you might just need a fine needle aspiration where they suck out the, the contents of the cyst and have that looked under the microscope. If it's a solid lump, meaning made out of tissue, they might do a core biopsy. And yes, as long as they get their needle in the right place and take enough samples, typically three or four samples with a core biopsy, it should be conclusive. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two questions here about fibrocystic breasts that are very similar questions, so I'm going to kind of combine them in the interest of time. Um, first of all, kind of what's the difference between fibrocystic breasts and dense breasts, and um, would a doctor give you a different uh, idea of when you should have a mammogram based on whether or not you have fibrocystic or dense breasts? So they are not the same thing. Let's say that right away. And the, the term fibrocystic breasts is one of my pet peeves. Um, most of the time when women are told that they have fibrocystic breasts, it's because their doctor's done a breast exam and their breasts feel lumpy or because they have a soreness and tenderness in their breasts. And it's, a, it's the family doctor's way of coming up with a medically sounding term that will reassure the woman that they don't think it's cancer. Um, women who have cysts in their breast which are fluid-filled lumps, which can be quickly diagnosed on ultrasound. You can't tell when you feel a lump whether it's cancer or not. You can't tell whether it's benign or cancer. Um, but, but having cysts is different than this term fibrocystic. I really don't like the term. Uh, a pathologist looking at tissue under the microscope is in a position to call tissue fibrocystic change, but not anybody who's just done a breast exam or even based on a mammogram, we, we really shouldn't use that term. So having said that, um, it, it, it really doesn't mean anything. To me, it means normal, tender, lumpy breasts. And yes, you should have uh, mammography. And, um, and uh, if there's any discrete lump that the doctor's worried about, yes, you should have ultrasound. Did I answer both of those questions? Uh, yeah, and I guess um, they were also asking just about uh, having fibrocystic breasts, but the doctor um, doesn't want them having a mammogram yet because of their age, which is 37. Um, does that sound well, correct, I guess? That's a, that's a, that sounds okay. Now, here's where it would be a real benefit if the woman herself had done breast self-exam and knew whether there had been a change in her breast texture. If you've got tender, lumpy breasts and your doctor does a breast exam and they're not worried and they think you they feel within the range of normal, then they probably won't send you for a mammogram. But if you go in and say, hey, Dr. Smith, I check my breasts regularly and this lump over here was not here before and I'm worried about it, that's a whole different story. Okay, interesting, thank you. Uh, once again, in the interest of time, there's a few very similar questions regarding ultrasounds here I'm gonna combine. 
um, essentially uh, discussing the difficulty in convincing doctors to give an ultrasound when breast density is a known issue. Um, so questions along the line of what would you recommend if I've been told I have dense breasts when I have mammograms done, have talked to my doctor about it, but he's not concerned. Is there anybody else we could see or anything we could say to assist in having ultrasounds done uh, concurrently with mammograms? Well, that's that's a regional question. For example, in mm -hmm. British Columbia, uh, now that patients are being informed, and we're certainly uh, we're that we're um, in a asked to be on a committee to actually teach GPs about it because it's going to be new to them. Uh, our province does not cover uh, screening ultrasound with our public health insurance. So if a woman wants to have screening ultrasound, she can have it, but she has to pay privately. And even if her doctor gave her a requisition and said, my patient has dense breasts, her mother died of cancer, um, I want her to have a screening breast ultrasound, the requisition doesn't make any difference. Our, our health insurance does not cover it. So uh, right. say, to the answer to your the question is, find out if there's some place that does screening breast ultrasound where you can go and pay privately and make sure they don't rip you off too much. Um, but I would also say that if you're going to go and have any breast test, um, you should try to go to a place that does the full gamut of breast uh, diagnosis. So for example, I get referrals um, to people sent to me because they've been told they need a biopsy and they went to some clinic somewhere where they don't do mammograms and they don't scan that many breasts and they don't really have very much experience. And you know the thing that they saw doesn't need a biopsy and now they've terrified the lady. Uh, so try to go somewhere where um, not only will they do the screening ultrasound, but they'll do the needle biopsy if you need it. And they'll look at your mammogram or they'll do the mammogram if you haven't had one and need one. Okay, thanks very much. I know that's a bit of a tricky question, so I think that's a very good answer given the circumstance. Um, I'm just going to do one more here. We're running just a little over time, but we've had a lot of fantastic questions, so thanks everyone for, for uh, writing in your questions. We've gotten through most of them here. Um, so the last one we'll have here is, I have very, uh, oops, sorry, I have very dense breasts with no fat uh, and a lump in my left breast. A 3D mammogram has been done and my ultrasound's on Saturday. If it is still suspicious, what would I expect the next step to be? Um, well, first of all, it's not suspicious yet, <laughs> but if, if you have a, a lump and they see it on the ultrasound and they're worried about it, then the next step would be a needle biopsy. Okay, perfect. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll finish off our webinar today.